Ignite students, we're back. We've got a new edition. Here we go. Spectroscopy part two. Okay, let's review. Let's pick up right where we left off. This is one of the things that was interesting. This is one of the most important things. Every element is unique. Every element's unique. And so when this electron goes from ground state to the first excited state to the second excited state, remember we said there's a ladder or a set of stairs, a staircase, but each one is unique. The distance between rungs on the ladder for one atom and the distance between rungs on another atom are not the same. All right? That's where we started. And so this different colors of light get ejected or absorbed as this atom as this atom, as the electron, moves up and down between the excited state and the ground state. All right. So, now, here we go. There. This is it. This is the big image. It's got everything in one nice little spot here. We have a hot bulb. And we have a cool gas, relatively cool. It is not hot, but there's a single element, whatever it is. Maybe it's a helium gas cloud. Okay. This hot bulb is really made of a tungsten filament, right? It's a single thing. It's glowing hot on the inside. So the type of spectrum it emits is a continuous spectrum over here. In fact, there's a guy, Kirchhoff, K-I-R-C-H-H-O-F-F, -F, Kirchhoff. It's got three laws about this, okay? So a luminous solid, liquid, or dense gas, in other words, this piece of metal is a solid, and it's hot, and it's glowing hot, and it's luminous, it's going to emit a continuous spectrum over here. You're going to get all sorts of wavelengths that's going to follow the black body curve, which we talked about the shape and how much light it's going to emit at each different color. All right. Now, over here, cool gas emission spectrum. This says cool gas. Cool gas works. Kirchhoff's laws actually say a hot gas. What's the difference? The relative temperature of this really means the amount of energy inside. And the more energy there is inside of this, the brighter these lines are going to be and the more they're going to exist. So a cool gas, yeah, is okay. The warmer this is, the better this is. And an emission spectrum is absolutely a fingerprint. It is unique to a single element, single compound, single molecule. It's unique, and it's very important. Okay, now, third Kirchhoff's rule says we're going to take this light, which is, should give me all the colors, and I'm going to run it through a cool gas. Because this should be all the colors. This cool gas is going to absorb and leave black streaks at just very specific spots because the energy that goes in from here is absorbed and the electron goes up. And then when that electron takes that little bit of energy out, you get one single black streak over here. And you're like, but doesn't later the electron fall and that light go back off? That's a great question. Yes, it does. Except the electron's spinning around and it's going to go off randomly. It could go off this way, this way, this way, this way, whichever way it wanted. It could go off this way and provide this over here. But because we took a source of light and then we pulled out those individual things and then we scattered them in all different directions, you're going to get this absorption spectrum where there is light missing in little bitty black bands. And that's an absorption spectrum. That's Kirchhoff's third law, that you have to have a continuous spectrum run into a cool gas to have the absorption occur. Okay. Spectroscopy is awesome. It's one of the most powerful tools in astronomy. And the number of things that have come about because of spectroscopy, the amount of understanding, is really hard to overstate. The fact that the universe is expanding, the universe is expanding. 
we know that because we look at all these distant stars and all these distant galaxies and they're all moving away from us. How do we know they're moving away from us? Because the Doppler effect works for a wave and we look at these waves and we use spectroscopy. And so the shift that I showed you last week, all right, the shift that I'll show you again right now, 15 here, this shift, this is what you would get in the lab, this middle bar, all right, it's going to be irrelevant, the middle bar right there. Doppler shift, something moving away from you goes to longer wavelengths. Doppler shift to something coming towards you goes to shorter wavelengths. It's that simple. If we look at all the stars, they're all shifted to the red side for longer wavelengths. All right, we know that. Hey, guess what? How about this one? That was 15. Let's go to 18 here. If you get a star and that star is rotating this side, is coming towards you. You're going to have shorter wavelengths. This side's going away from you. You're going to have longer wavelengths. So if the, this is just regular light, should be here. You're going to get a little bit of blue, a little bit of red, and you're just going to get instead of one skinny little line, you're going to get a big, broad, fat line. That's spectral um, widening, okay, or line widening. So the width of the line can tell you about the star's rotation. So we can get whether the star is receding. Or approaching we can get whether the star is rotating and we know what the star is made from of and we've never even gone there this is just looking at a detailed picture of the star at a long distance spectroscopy is very important for a lot of the work that happens in astronomy okay now telescopes I am a huge fan of the HST the Hubble Space Telescope is a monster it's something the size of a bus that was chucked on the back of the space shuttle and hauled into space. And then there was a problem with it, and it was fixed in space on a spacewalk with a crazy set of glasses. The thing is still kicking almost 30 years on. It is awesome. It is the single most important scientific instrument man has ever created, period. Hard stop, F sorry, full stop. No exceptions, no ifs, ands, or buts. The single greatest instrument man has ever done. You might be like, um, I think people are healthier now because of the microscope and we found all these little things and germs and bacteria and we can, yes, you're right. The microscope is important, but you can't point to one microscope in a lab somewhere that did all the discoveries. There's a microscope in this lab and that lab and that lab and that lab. And I'm saying one instrument. The Hubble telescope did all of this stuff. The only thing that's even close, even in the same category, is the Large Hadron Collider um, in CERN in France and uh, Switzerland under the border. If you're a particle physics, maybe you'll give me an argument, but the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, let's start real simple. Here, uh, five, well, yeah, five. Two major types of telescopes. You know, telescopes, they're light buckets. Bigger the bucket, the more light you collect and the more sensitive a measurement you can make. All right, two biggest types, refractors. Refraction is bending light as it changes substances and reflectors. A reflection is bending light, but changing its direction when it hits off of a surface. Mirror. It turns around. Refractor is when light goes from air to glass. It bends and comes narrower. So you have a focus. This is a refractor. This is a reflector. There are pros and cons to both. Outside of the home telescope from your that you might have in a backyard, 98% of all telescopes and all massive telescopes are reflectors. They are not refractors. Okay. So that's five. Here we go. Seven. And among reflectors, we have several vocab words here that we could look at. Light comes in over here. Light comes in 
from it's something distant. From something distant, the light's almost parallel. It goes all the way to the bottom. The bottom focuses this light back up here. That is the prime focus. But then you put in a secondary mirror, not this back mirror. That's the primary mirror. And then here are three different types of things to do with that. The Newtonian focus, this might be one you'd have in your backyard, just intercepts that light, bends it, and puts it out an eyepiece on the side. The Cassegrain focus puts it out another hole in the straight in the back. Well, that's fine, but you've got a hole in that big mirror in the back that you used to have nice and clean. It's okay. The, the Naismith focus is very similar to the Newtonian. It just involves another focus. So you're bouncing light in, up, back, eyepiece. And here's what's more modern. These aren't eyepieces. These are now cameras. They're CCD detectors. Okay, once we went away from film, you put the same digital chip inside of a camera right here on this eyepiece, and you collect all this data, except you can use a really, really nice uh, detector. A really, really nice chip. All right. So let's get, I'm going to show you this. Eight. Okay. Those, that's two twin telescopes. You probably not be able to see it. The guy in the jump, orange jumpsuit right there, that's Keck. Keck one and Keck two. Okay. Long time ago in a land far, far away, I had a, shared a cubicle with a, uh, young scientist, Ginger Bringleson. And so Ginger came running down the hallway. She comes into the lab one day, super excited. She says, I got it, I got it, I got it. She got her time on Keck. Scientists from around the world apply. They're like, hey, I've got this cool star I want to look at. Hey, I've got this interesting idea. I want to run an experiment. And the people at Keck run this giant list and you are set up night after night after night after night. And then you've got, you've got three hours tonight and you've got a half a night tomorrow and you've got Six months from now, you get a, three nights in a row to observe. And you use one telescope or two telescopes. Two telescopes makes it like binoculars. Okay. Ginger comes running down the hall. She gets, included with her observation time, a trip to Hawaii. Keck is on top of Mauna Kea, 14,000 feet up a dormant volcano in Hawaii. Gets to go out there and spend a week, work in the observatory, collect her data, and then come back. Awesome, awesome that she got all this. The problem is it's 14,000 feet up. It is cold on top of that mountain. you got to take your parka. You're working every night, and you really don't have a chance to visit Hawaii while you're there. All right? But it's a really big, impressive thing that she got her time when we were back just still grad students. All right. So that's Keck 1 and 2. All right, that was eight. Let's look here. Why in the world would you put this, that telescope millions and millions and millions of dollars on top of a mountain? Look, there's Keck 1 and 2. There's the Subaru. There's this Japanese telescope. There's an infrared. There's Canada, France, Gemini, the UK telescope. All of these are on top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It's absolutely incredible. Why 14,000 feet up? Because you're above all the city lights, because you're above the clouds, because warm air rising. Look out over a hot desert road and you see the ripples in the air. When you're making a really professional, high quality observation, you don't want those ripples going across your field of vision. You get up above the heat. You get up above the clouds, you get up above the water vapor, and you get up all above all of this. And so that little bitty real estate at the top of that dormant volcano has some of the most high-tech equipment more scientists in that small area than you can imagine it's a really cool place all right so here's 12 um this is the very large telescope which they really just use these four telescopes as one this is in atacama desert in chile because you go up on a mountain, you're in the middle of the desert, so there's no clouds. You can observe 365 nights a year. You don't have to worry, and you just take pictures. And it's really cool stuff, all right? Uh, so 
what do we got? Oh, there we go. It's it's buffering here. 23. Telescopes are really cool because this is the NRAO, National Radio Observatory Array. This is in the U.S. That is a giant radio telescope. And depending on what you're wanting to observe, stars, starlight, one of those on Keck, behind Keck said it was an infrared telescope. You need a little bitty mirror. Remember, radio waves are larger. If you want to observe a radio wave, you've got to have a much bigger antenna. Let's see if I can click through. Let me get 24 here. Here's 24. This is Arecibo. Arecibo is the name of the observatory. They just literally cut a hole in the side of that mountain and lined it with the stuff for a telescope. So all the light comes in, and then this up here hanging off these gantry wires is the receiver that you see. This is people walking on the inside of this. This is in Puerto Rico. It is a radio telescope. You can't aim it anywhere because it's just cut into the ground. But as the Earth turns, it gets to look at all sorts of different stuff. It's a very cool telescope. Okay. There are lots of these cool telescopes. Here is part of your assignment. You are supposed to tell me, I want to know about Hubble, and I want to know about James Webb. The details are in the assignment to go with today. Guys, have a good day.